You know, I hope this will be interesting uh, for all of you. You know, this is definitely uh, not mind blowing. Um, you know, I am a just of a regular backend software developer, so you know, I'm not an expert in this material. So everything I say, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, the presentation itself, uh, it's going to be about a little bit about deep learning uh, and uh, a lot about uh, this one kind of uh, project that I got started off with. Um, the presentation itself uh, is divided into three parts. Uh, first one, just kind of just graze over what you know neural networks are, uh, what all this you know deep learning stuff is, um, um, and we're gonna take a kind of a, 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 a bit more focused look on a classifier model called a VGG. Uh, in part two, um, I'll introduce uh, you to the actual competition itself. Uh, and in the last part, I'll uh, introduce you to a methodology that, um, that you know, I used to kind of get started with this competition. And it's got a decent uh, performance, but there's lots of avenue for, uh, for making it you know, better. So what is deep learning? Um, you know, unless you've been living under a rock, um, deep learning is here. You know, a lot of people have said, you know, this is the new electricity. It'll drive just about everything we do. Um, it's perfectly suited for this massive amount of data uh, that the current kind of technology is generating in every sphere of our life. Uh, it has been extremely uh, successfully used in a wide variety of machine learning tasks. Uh, computer vision, uh, image recognition, all the self-driving you know, um, driving cars, uh, for example, you know, are using uh, some form of uh, neural networks, uh, language translation, Google Translate, um, and you know, many other kind of tasks in the speech processing and natural language understanding sphere of things. Uh, Google Voice, Alexa, um, IBM's Watson, all of them understand our speech uh, using, you know, fundamentally, uh, some of the capabilities of deep learning. And uh, deep learning uh, in a lot of these tasks, uh, you know, the results that have shown that the performance of some of these uh, uh, these models have kind of completely uh, overshadowed, you know, every like just about every other model in the respective domains, and the and the performance is comparable to that of human trials or human subjects. Now that is mind blowing. Uh, convolution networks, uh, you know, very quickly, uh, those are just a small um, one class of all the neural networks uh, architecture there are out there. Um, you know, it has been used extensively, uh, so far so good for computer vision. All the experts will say that, you know, uh, these networks have, can be used in, in so many different ways. For example, at the kernel of the um, the AI that was used to beat the, you know, the expert Go player, you know, was, was a convolution network. Uh, at the heart of, you know, uh, this architecture is what we call a uh, convolutional operator, uh, you know, and that is basically kind of an averaging function that uh, traverses a, uh, you know, a, a set of data uh, over a domain. Um, I cannot find a an easier way to say that, so I'm not going to go into it. Uh, you know, just have to kind of uh, do some research on your own. Um, it was for, first developed in the 1990s. Uh, you know, the founder is uh, very often kind of credited to uh, Jan Likun. Although it wasn't until, uh, you know, around 2010 uh, that, you know, uh, somebody kind of found out that you could uh, uh, use this uh, on a standard GPU because uh, back in the 90s you know, they didn't have GPUs and all the, compu uh, the, the amount of computational complexity of this problem you know, is so, so large that it was, it was just not you know, a, a mainstream um, a solution to a lot of the problems. So 2012, uh, some guys found out that you could use a GPU, build this extremely deep layer that perform extremely well in a computer vision task, and the convolution networks basically kind of kick-started the deep learning revolution. So, uh, <clears throat> the model 
the, uh, the model that we're using or that you know, I've used uh, in this competition is, um, you know, uh, it's called the VZZ model. Uh, it was uh, developed by some researchers at the University of Oxford. Um, you know, the, the, the way that it is extraordinary, I guess, is that um, you know, it has this, and it, it, was, it was not the first of its kind, but you know, what it is is an extremely deep model. And you know, year after year, you know, scientists and researchers were able to kind of, kind of verify this um, um, kind of heuristic um, you know, process that deeper models you know, perform extremely well in tasks of computer vision and architecture. And the VZZ model in particular you know, is extraordinary because uh, it uses an extremely kind of a simple architecture, um, you know, which is basically a repeating homogeneous set of computational layers uh, to achieve the same kind of performance that much more complex models have used. So what we have um, in this model is uh, kind of a, uh, you know, the outermost, the outermost uh, layer on the left, which looks at an image which is, uh, you know, 224 by 224, uh, and in three color channels. And, and it applies a series, a series of convolution operators, uh, does some max pulling, which is basically taking some average, um, and then, you know, uh, take, uh, take some other averaging function to progressively um, kind of downsample the size of the image until uh, it gets to this uh, point where um, you know, the, the output from some of this, this layer is mapped into a set of fully connected layers. So, um, you know, it takes a little bit of kind of knowledge to understand what the convolution and the fully connected layers are, but uh, they're all, you know, fundamentally based on the concept of, um, you know, the, this unifying architecture of neural networks. And, um, you know, we can think of the, the architecture on the left as being kind of an image processing unit, uh, while the set of layers on the right as being a, a classifier model, which, which takes the input from the convolution or the image processing layer and understands and you know, does some, some stuff on its, uh, that it's designed to. Uh, in this particular um, uh, example, the fully connected layer uh, serves to you know, look at the images or get the, in, uh, the, uh, the, the input from the convolution layers and then classify uh, what it is looking at. Uh, the, so, the competition itself uh, that you know, I kind of got engaged into uh, is uh, hosted by Kaggle. Uh, it recently got acquired by Google. Um, just an, an interesting observation. <laughs> um, so the task uh, at hand is to classify, um, you know, a given set of images into three different <coughs> categories. Uh, what they have are images of, um, you know, services uh, or services, um, you know, just um, human anatomy. Um, and the objective is, you know, given this, this images, uh, the, the challenge is to be able to kind of say, um, you know, what, not necessarily with, you know, what kind of, you know, cancer they already have, but the propensity of, you know, which uh, propensity of what each one of those uh, kind of sample or test of patient is going to uh, kind of, you know, will, will likely acquire uh, in the future. So, uh, you know, we have these three different classes, uh, you know, they simply call it type one, type two, and type three. Uh, about a thousand images are given to us, uh, and our job, um, you know, and, and the 8,000 images, you know, we know what the different classes are. Uh, that's also going to be our training and our validation set. Um, and, then, and then we're given a set of 512 images, uh, which, you know, basically need to um, provide our predictions for. So we're, you know, we look at this set of images, we have no idea what they are, and we're supposed to say, 
you know, image A is, you know, 90% type 1, uh, certain percent, you know, uh, could be a type 2 and type 3. And based on those uh, percentages, uh, you know, the competition itself evaluates a score, uh, which, uh, you know, which, which uh, if you get it high enough, you'll win maybe $50,000. <laughs> Now, um, you know, these are some of the sample images. Um, uh, you know, the only reason I have them up here is to kind of give you the, a sense of the magnitude of the problem. Um, you know, we have type 1, type 2, and type 3. Uh, so these images are, you know, for uh, somebody like me without any kind of medical background. I have no, no idea what they are, right? And this is kind of the antithesis of, you know, being a data scientist is not to have any idea of what, you know, you're looking at. Um, you know, some of the other uh, challenges, of, you know, about these images are, you know, some of these images are completely out of focus. Um, you know, they are taken at different angles, apparently, uh, under very different lighting conditions. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we have this image on the bottom bottom uh, left, you know, it's this weird green color. Uh, no idea why, why that happened, it's just the image that were given to us. Uh, and then we have these foreign objects in the images, you know, these this metal frames in some of these images that, you know, um, are just there. So, uh, you know, and I've looked at a couple of them, you know, not kind of um, really looked into the image, uh, but you know, just from uh, my perspective, you know, I have no idea what I'm looking at. And yet I'm kind of, you know, throwing this model at it. So, before you, before, uh, you know, in the spirit of this um, um, kind of methodology, uh, before you just throw an arbitrary uh, classifier on it, uh, you know, we're, we're, what we do is we actually take what is called a pre-trend model. And in this case, I just happen to uh, be using a VGT model, you know, the model that I kind of briefly showed you about. Now, what does it mean to be a pre-trained model? So a pre-trained model, uh, in this case, uh, the VGT, is a model that has been kind of trained to recognize objects from a different database. And a very popular um, uh, database, you know, that a lot of these very advanced network architectures are trained against is a uh, database called the ImageNet. Uh, the ImageNet itself consists of like a million pictures um, with over a thousand different kinds of objects, you know. And, and the, you know, there are things like, you know, like German Shepherd or Border Collie or cats um, and, you know, Siamese cats and, you know, some kind of a plant and all that stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, we took a pre-trained VGT model um, uh, you know, that, that's been trained on this database. Uh, and what we do uh, as a second step is we take the final layer, uh, which we kind of briefly, I said, was the classifying layer, and we just trade that away, and then we put our own layer in, uh, which has, you know, three different outputs. Each one of the output, sure, go for it. Just, you're taking a previously trained model right. on the images you're talking about that are dogs and cats. Right. Well, not necessarily dogs and cats. But whatever. Just right. Yeah. Right? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yes. And you're ripping off its last classification layer. Right. And then you're going to train it on these pictures and categories. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, towards the end, we'll briefly discuss the intuition behind doing that. Um, again, a lot of this actually, um, and I, you know, have, I have a small line at the bottom that says that. A lot of this idea was taken from a uh, video lecture series uh, by, uh, well, from Fasted AI, uh, which I kind of got introduced to via Danny. Um, but you know, we'll get to the intuition behind what we're doing uh, with taking a pre-trained model and you know, following this methodology. Um, but until then, just bear with me. So, uh, so second step. Does this pre-trained model have? How many? How many categories of these images? It has a thousand different categories. And, you know, those are, you know, things like, you know, say, I mean, it's cat. Right, yeah. Um, and a lot of, you know, advanced architectures, uh, you know, continue to use that as a basis for evaluating the performance of their 
model. So uh, in the third process, uh, what we do now is we have this massive model trained on some kind of a database. Uh, we kind of fix all the layers uh, except for the new layer that we just introduced, uh, which is the one we want to train. And you know, we just go ahead and train it. Uh, and you know, during the course of the training, we progressively kind of make each uh, you know, layer ahead of it kind of trainable. Um, and you know, we just keep doing that and evaluate um, you know, uh, some parameters and see how well our, our um, model is doing. And that's, that's kind of the state I'm in. Uh, right now, you know, just diagrammatically, uh, kind of showing you what, what's happening here. You know, that was our VCC model. You know, we have all of this stuff uh, on the left, you know, which is basically kind of looking at the pictures, you know, doing its magic. Um, and then I told you the, the layer at the end, uh, the very most, the rightmost part, is what is called the softmax, or equivalently the classifying layer. We originally had a thousand different layers or neurons in the outermost layer. We just take it apart, you know, put our own custom soft, uh, softmax layer with three outputs, you know, fix all of this, and then just you know, um, start training the model, right? But this time fitting our, um, our images of the surfaces. Now, uh, briefly touched on this. Once we've trained our um, only the uh, the custom softmax layer, uh, you know, at some point it kind of saturates. It doesn't exactly get better. Uh, so what what you know has seen what you know I've seen to help is uh, to now kind of train all the dense layers, uh, you know, together with with the last one, while still kind of holding this part fixed, okay? And so, you know, you go through the, a couple of epochs of doing that, uh, you know, through trial and error, you know, you just find out the, the optimal learning rate that helps you get at the best solution. Is that, and the, the new uh, set of layers that you're training are, are in the blue, is that correct, in that big block diagram? All of this <coughs> right here? Yeah, is that, is that, does that, is that represented by that blue box in the, in the... Oh, that one right here? <laughs> yeah, I clipped, you know, some of this because it wasn't kind of apparent, you know, what was, uh, what was there in the blue box, but, but that but is that, that. This thing to the right, right is really that little blue... Yes, right yeah, there. yeah, if you look at the All original the image... Fixed. Right. So, and this is why, you know, uh, this methodology has also been called transfer learning, is because we're transferring the knowledge that, you know, uh, this network acquired on some database onto something else. You could uh, potentially you know, take it a step further, um, kind of train a few convolution layers as well. Uh, also experimenting with you know, uh, your learning rate a little bit. Um, you know, this is when, you know, from my experience, you know, everything kind of, uh, kind of saturates. You know, by the time that you know, I've been able to, you know, I've, I've, I've done this, uh, it seems like you know the results are as good as it'll get. Uh, you know, not terribly um, awesome, but not like uh, bad either. So um, a brief intuition with you know what is happening in all these training processes, <clears throat> right? So we said you know we have this extremely massive level uh, layer you know model mm -hmm. trained it on something else, but then we're training it in uh, a different kind of data set. So, um, you know, uh, this guy, uh, and I'm sorry I don't remember his name, but what he did, <laughs> um, I actually, you know, kind of have, have it in the very last slide uh, in the works cited page, but uh, what he did was um, he built his own kind of neural model uh, with eight layers as opposed to like the 16, uh, you know, from the VGG. And then he trained it on, um, you know, the image net. And, you know, once that was done, uh, he looked at, you know, how each one of those layers, you know, what, what they were actually finding out, right? 
And because this is a neural net and the, the information that's kind of been shuffled around are the weights, um, you know, we could be looking at the weight uh, distribution, I suppose. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I again suppose that wouldn't make a lot of sense. So what he really did was, uh, you know, on this trained model, uh, he kind of showed different images uh, to, to, this, to, to this model that he had kind of trained on ImageNet. And he, what he found out was that uh, the first layer, which is the layer that's closest to the image itself, you know, it was responding to images that look like, like basic, you know, like this, you know, that, that had lines and, you know, very basic edges. And that's what, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the general community kind of now believes. Um, and I have no other uh, reason to kind of believe otherwise, is that the, la the first layer now, what it does is it starts responding to, uh, you know, images that are like simple shapes. And that could be, you know, in this case, just lines kind of going on the, going everywhere. The, s the layer uh, kind of inward, the second layer, uh, uh, the filters in the second layer he found out were actually kind of responding to uh, images that, you know, were a little bit more geometrically complex. So you can see that, you know, now it's start, you know, the, the images on the second layer or the filters in the second layer are kind of responding to things like curves and, you know, maybe, you know, basic circles, uh, come some, you know, basic patterns and, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, going, you know, deeper in, um, we find that the, the filters in this layers in the third layer now, you know, are responding to slightly more uh, complex uh, kind of shapes and patterns. Um, you know, you can see kind of rough uh, images of, you know, the car wheels and maybe even the shapes of the humans and stuff like that kind of show up. Um, yeah, and the next slide is, you know, just more of that. Um, uh, deeper layers responding to kind of, you know, more and more complex patterns. And so how this kind of, you know, fits into the idea of the learning that we're using is that our VTZ model, you know, or at least some parts of it have learned to detect shapes and kind of edges, right, just because of the fact that it's been trained on the ImageNet database. And we're using that capability uh, to, to yeah, and have it look at our own images, uh, you know, the, the images of the cervixes for this competition and see how, if or whether or not it actually kind of makes, you know, can make any sense out of the things it's seeing. And that's basically, you know, uh, I, I suppose the intuition behind, uh, you know, the, this methodology. Final words. Um, you know, this is a plain vanilla kind of methodology. Uh, you know, just my experiments, uh, you know, uh, what, from what I've done uh, on the public leaderboard, uh, this submission has made it to the top 10%. Um, it achieves about a 67% accuracy on the validation set. Now, a validation set is, uh, you know, a set of data that the, 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 the model has not had a chance to look at, right? And the fact that it has, you know, it achieves a 67% accuracy means that it's, it's definitely not random because, you know, if, you, if it was just making random predictions, then, you know, you'd have like something like 33%. Uh, lots of question, uh, you know, just naturally arises, you know, what is it learning? Uh, because just looking back at the images themselves, <laughs> You know, I have no idea what it's learning. <laughs> um, you know, those are naturally questions, kind of more uh, research oriented, uh, but something that would be very interesting to uh, to explore and may even, you know, be a novel uh, work on this field. You know, how is it able to discriminate between these images? Um, you know, I mean, given you know, granted that you know, it can detect maybe shapes or kind of patches on the skin, but, um, you know, is there any kind of a regular pattern in which uh, those things show for all these different kinds of um, potentially cancerous cervix images? 
you know, those are pretty deep questions, actually. Uh, also, for the sake of this competition, um, how can we make it better, right? Um, lots of avenues we can pursue. Uh, one of the things that you know I would like to try is, you know, obviously there are a lot of images on the training set that are really bad. You know, it's out of focus. It's this weird green light uh, that obviously does not mean anything, and it could just be contributing to make uh, to making the model worse. Um, some of the other things is, um, you know, maybe uh, do some kind of an image transformation using some, um, some open source image processing tools such as OpenCV, right? Uh, you know, we might be able to increase the contrast, maybe add some resolution to the images. I, I don't know what works. Um, we can also try a new classifying architecture. Uh, for that matter, uh, Matt over there uh, at the back, you know, he um, uh, used um, uh, Google Net, for example, or ResNet actually, uh, to train on these images from scratch, and he's got you know pretty good results as well. Uh, but we could always kind of see uh, take a pre-trained model of ResNet, which is considered the state of the art uh, for the time being, and see how you know using this methodology of transfer learning kind of performs for this problem. Um, Another thing that you know would be interesting and it's a very specul uh, speculative would be the usage of you know um, image augmentation or even GAN networks. Uh, GAN standing for uh, generative adversarial <coughs> networks, um, you know, which has kind of become the latest hype in the deep learning community. Uh, best thing of all, you know, uh, so far so good. Uh, you know, I've been doing this work and on some Amazon uh, cloud machines. Uh, right now, all this information is kind of open source. You know, I've uh, put all the code, code on the source on my GitHub, as well as uh, provided an Amazon image that uh, somebody you know you could just kind of spin up and you know have a complete uh, starter you know set of code and data set to begin your own experiments in. And that is just the state of things. I'll take any questions if you have any. Uh, could you touch a little bit more on the uh, intuition behind transfer learning versus just retraining the entire BGG on the image set that you have? Sure. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we mentioned that, um, you know, once uh, when we have when we take a when we take a, when we take a pre-trained model from BGG, then uh, the layers of BGG, you know, uh, the 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 one at the very front have kind of learned to detect basic shapes and you know progressively more complex geometrical shapes, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so we're leveraging that capability uh, to see how well it can classify. You know these novel items, things that it has never seen before. Now, how does that compare to just training everything you know from scratch? Uh, first of all, the VDZ model itself, uh, in order to train it on the image net, you know, it, uh, I think it took you know some of these guys like over a week on a four GPU environment. Uh, so, so the the training itself is extremely expensive. Uh, so we have something to gain, you know, by using a uh, a pre-trained model. The second thing I went ahead and tried, and this is you know uh, counter, a little counterintuitive, uh, is you know I had this pre-trained model. I do the fine tuning. I tuned my fully connected layers and all that stuff, and uh, I just you know for the sake of it, just set all of them as being trainable and just kind of ran the model, you know, on the on the entire thing, and you know the results were not good. You know, <laughs> the results. Uh, you know, did not improve. It not only not improved, but uh, my validation loss, you know, was just fluctuating, kind of uh, in, in 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 an order of magnitude higher than uh, what it was, you know, when I held the convolution layers as being constant. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it would make sense that if you just set everything to be trainable, then the the system would kind of, uh, you know, rearrange itself. Uh, so that so that its performance is optimal 
Uh, so far, so good. I just have not found that to be the case. So, very related question. Sure. Um, it seems like if you've got a pre-trained neural net effectively, right? Let's just say you have 20 inputs. Gotcha. It, it, the weights are set. Yeah. Did you shuffle your inputs? Did you did you basically say I don't know what inputs you have, right? But you know, average value of this type of color. I don't I don't know what your inputs were, but did you shuffle them to see if you got a better outcome based on? Because I, I got to assume that you have just landing areas for data if you've already pre-trained on something completely different. Mm -hmm. So it's a random guess where you put your data. So my question is, really, did you shuffle them and was there a difference? Well, you're not talking about shuffling the order in which the, you, you present the images, right? You're no, I'm talking about like the value of first, the pixels. first vector right. is then now suddenly the last vector. Just truly just shuffling the inputs and seeing <clears> if there was an impact. Uh, so, uh, you know, these images, uh, originally as they came, um, uh, you know, were a couple of thousand pixels, you know, wide and high, right? So, uh, our model takes only input, you know, of dimensions 224 by 224. So, we had to do, you know, there has to be a, lot of, a little bit of a pre-processing towards the beginning where you, uh, you know, OpenCV for that matter, kind of take the entire uh, image and uh, and I'm sure it uses some averaging functions so that it reduces the uh, dimensions of the image. Um, after that has been done, uh, what we also do is uh, we um, normalize the value of uh, the, the, the pixel value of each of the color channel before mm -hmm. feeding it into the, con in, into the network. And the reason behind that is um, especially in neural networks and deep learning, you know, you're uh, kind of encouraged to have all of your input kind of centered around a mean value, uh, uh, centered around the origin by subtracting it from mean, and additionally kind of multiply using, this, using the standard deviation or something. And uh, so we definitely do that, you know, uh, normalize the, the input uh, pixel value in a certain way. Uh, you know, a standard, uh, uh, a standard accepted way. I guess in my, my like, so if you put every pixel, right, right, and then you had like three properties per pixel, right, and you just started from left to right, mm -hmm. just so if you did it that way, right, and then you started from the last pixel and worked your way back. That's what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. like shuffling or picking randomly, right, from the pixels because. I just sometimes well, well, in my why would you want to do that? I mean, that would yeah. destroy the spatial structure. Yeah, that would destroy the, the spatial arrangement of the pixels. Precisely right? what, what the advantage of using that model is. So, the reason I'm trying to understand is, if you've pre-trained a model, it's already figured out weights. It's ignoring some of the channels, right? And it's overweighting some of the other channels. And so, depending on where you start, what you I mean, feed in. Yeah, the convolutional so network is, that it's, it's very out of your level respect. <laughs> with respect to movement. So you can put this, this image, a given image in one place on the, on the, on the screen and okay. move it and it'll come up with exactly the same categorization. That's what a convolutional network does. It's translational invariant. It's not rotational invariant, but it's translational. Well, and 67% <laughs> with 33%, it's not going to do well if you randomize the pixels. That's kind of well, Yes, sir, please. Um, I'll get back to you. So you, you said several times during your talk, um, I don't know what it's recognizing, or I, I don't know when I look at an image, I don't know what it would, it's um, fixed on. Right. But uh, you've also shown several pages of the different layers, and you have both um, what appears to be a geometric representation of the filter and an associated, probably well correlated image. Is that correct? Yes. Is would you say that that geometric representation of the filter is 100%? Is it what, if you gave the image that had that pattern on it, it would give you a one at that layer at that particular filter in terms of 100% recognition? Or is there another image that this would come up with for each of these things It would be 100% recognition on those? And uh, I'm just trying to figure out 
if you could at the end train by seeing how many of your filters at a particular layer have recognition at at one hundred percent. Right. So uh, you know, let me kind of proceed. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, by saying that you know the guy who actually did this experiment, he went on to win the ImageNet competition the following year, right? So having you know this understanding is extremely helpful. Uh, this demonstration uh, specifically is uh, specific only to this eight-layer eight model that he constructed, mm -hmm. uh, and I assume entirely for his own understanding. Um, now, my, my intuition is, you know, if you, ha if this image produced, you know, that kind of a, uh, 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 you know, or that kind of an activation for this layer, uh, uh, on this filter, on this layer, and if something else produced the exact kind of activation, I would imagine um, you know, that would produce the same class value, ultimately. Because uh, the set of fully connected layers uh, that we saw on the right <coughs> are, you know, in fact, uh, doing nothing more than just, you know, taking the input, this array of input from the convolution layer right before it, and it's just kind of <coughs> learning to classify how uh, each one of those, you know, input, uh, you know, what it should be. So I would imagine, yeah, uh, if we had another image producing the same exact activation, then, um, you know, it would produce the same class table. However, um, however, if this test image that you came up with, you know, triggered the activation not only on that particular filter, but also on a different filter for that layer, then you're really looking at kind of a composition of these two activations, right? And that could correspond to a different class level. So definitely would have to kind of take, take that into consideration as and well. And do you know in that picture whether that, those show isolation of a particular filter? Because there seems to be an association, at least for us, that this is maybe a well activated image for that particular filter and maybe there's less of that uh, composition that you're talking about. Right. And and the choice of these filters, you know, were taken were uh, taken, you know, very specifically to show this activation. Okay. Uh, so it's not necessary that every image would, you know, produce a very well defined activation for a particular layer or filter. So the fact that you did so well on transfer learning though. Right tends to make me feel that the concept of grandmother cells is not happening here. I, I'm, I've never heard of that. By that I mean, cells. in other words, you're, 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 there is a, this combination. You're getting different filters activating for each and every image, probably. Oh, God, you're right. Combination. So yeah. the, con the old concept of grandmother cells, uh, which in oh. the real brain is okay. considered a joke currently, and that might change. But anyway. But that's all I'm, all I'm pushing is that I think the idea that you have those latter layers recombining and reweighting those different filter outputs is, is very significant. Right, sure. Did you, did you have available in your, in your uh, cervical cancer images any normal cervical in, images or were all of the images that you were training on um, cancerous images? Well, um, and I may not have said that uh, you know very nicely, but the the images themselves are not you know cancerous uh, services. Uh, the idea was, uh, you know, some of this or maybe most of this, uh, or maybe all of this, you know, cervixes uh, eventually you know kind of proceeded to be cancerous, right? Uh, the idea was, you know, by looking at these images as they are now. You know, is it possible to predict, you know, what kind of, um, uh, you know, what kind of cancer they will ultimately develop? And actually, maybe the matter of the fact is all of this, um, you know, sort of because eventually went on to become cancerous, uh, and that's why you know, they have this different, different type one, type two, and type three labels on them, right? But it wouldn't, uh, even before they become cancerous, uh, is it possible to look at them as they are before they are, you know, they have become cancerous? 
uh, and and make this prediction about you know what kind of cancer it's going to kind of kind of happen, so that the right <coughs> preventive treatment can can happen. So that was the, the, the that is the the focal uh, problem we're trying to solve. Okay, uh, and and just Aaron Aaron had mentioned something, that, and I think where where I would probably uh, say yeah, there's probably some merit to what what your idea that since his images vary by angle and light and rotation that it might behoove him to, to do some permutation of those images, some rotational, some reflection, um, so that he's got a rather a larger training set as a result as a result of that to give your to give your network a little bit more training. Just you've got a lot of variety oh, anyway. Right. Yes. Go ahead and throw mutation mutation, purposeful mutations of those images into your into your training right. um, to because they're, they're still type one type two right, type three right right yeah and and that's uh, that's something that you know I will say that I've uh, tried uh, because you know that's something that uh, faster AI kind of trades on as well um, you know I just kind of doubt that you know right at this point I think I'm not doing it right because it's not helping me <laughs> It's not helping me, or I just have to find a better way to do so it. Let's just do that one or focused. two more questions, and then open it up for lightning talk, and then have time to. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, I have a very nice impression about the database. Continuing, maybe this this uh, here. here. So, firstly, are these uh, classifications to be considered completely accurate, verified, or is there still some kind of error right there that there are, that there may be some some misclassifications? And secondly. Would it help if you were, for instance, to do some kind of pre-clustering of these images, maybe using some of the results of your, of your initial learning, and remove those that are completely uh, outliers, and that may be sort of uh, skewing and then sort of throwing off the learning process? Yes. Uh, so the first, uh, you know, um, your first question, those images are provided to us you know, as a part of the competition, right? This, you know, we have to kind of, I, I can't see a way to not accept them for what they are. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, we were told that, you know, this set of images are, you know, type 1 cancerous or potentially type 1 cancerous and type 2 and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, your second question, you know, is, is, is legitimate. That's the part that I would like to focus on is, is a lot of these images are you know, just bad samples of, you know, the representative uh, class. So it would definitely help to either throw them away um, uh, or maybe do some processing, you know, maybe change the lightning or whatever. Uh, one way to uh, do that would be just visually just kind of cross out the one that are obviously really blurry, uh, bad light, the green, you know, dark light. Uh, the second way that I just kind of thought about uh, looking at your presentation um, is you know kind of do a con confusion matri matrix uh, you know at every so interval and see all the images even in the training set that are being misclassified you know as you run through this uh, epochs um, and I and I you know have a feeling that it's going to be this consistent set of images in all the three classes that are you know kind of getting very hard to be recognized right this you know and use that way to kind of throw away some bad samples. That, that would probably help with the, with the model as well. Okay, so last question and then we're going to. Sure. What's the accuracy rate for validation sets? So uh, the best I could get to, if I remember correctly, um, is 67%, uh, um, right? I thought yeah. that's the test set. So um, that's the validation set. So that is the validation set. The test set, you, know, you have no idea what it is. Uh, you know, it's just a set of images. You give your predictions, you submit it to uh, the site, and it'll calculate some kind of score that'll place you know you, you in a in a particular rank. Um, but yeah, I mean, 67 percent um, is the accuracy of the validation data. If you keep kind of churning out these iterations, epoch after epoch, um, you know this validation uh, will will go down. And this is the problem of what what is called overfitting, which I'm sure a lot of you uh, know about. Uh, you know, this model, 
will at some point be able to predict all of the training data with 100% accuracy. Uh, but th that does not mean the model is any better. You know, it's, it's, it's learned that image set too well. Okay. Okay, this is